This episode of the Art of Manliness podcast is brought to you in part by The Strenuous Life. The Strenuous Life is an online platform that we created to help you put into action all the things we've been talking about, writing about on AOM for the past 12 years. We've done that in a few ways. First, we've got 50 different badges based around 50 different skills. We've got weekly challenges. We're going to put you outside of your comfort zone and accountability for your physical fitness, doing a good deed, thinking outside of yourself, as well as you'll be a part of a membership of like-minded individuals who are all pushing themselves to become better and more useful. Head over to strenuouslife.co. Find out more information, what's involved, what you get, and make sure you get your email on our waiting list so you'll be one of the first to know when enrollment opens up. Strenuouslife.co, hope to see you there. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. If boxing and Parkinson's disease are thought of together, it's usually in the terms of the former causing the latter. But my guest today makes the case that boxing workouts can actually be used to fight Parkinson's disease. His name is Aaron Sloan. He's a registered nurse and the owner of Engine Room Boxing Gym here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the founder of Ready to Fight Boxing Fitness Program catered specifically to those suffering from Parkinson's disease. We begin our conversation with an overview of what Parkinson's is, as well as the fact that men are significantly more likely to get it than women. Aaron then shares what the research says about the best treatments for Parkinson's, why vigorous, high-intensity exercise is one of the most potent remedies for it, and why he argues that boxing is the gold standard when it comes to the type of exercise that's most effective in slowing down the disorder. Aaron shares how he started Ready to Fight based on this premise and a few stories of how the lives of Parkinson's patients and their families are being changed by the program. We then discuss whether boxing also causes Parkinson's and how Aaron answers the criticism that he trains people in a sport that also creates the disorder he's trying to alleviate. We enter a conversation discussing what individuals with Parkinson's can do to learn more about incorporating boxing workouts into its treatment. After the show's over, check out our show notes at aom.is slash ready to fight. All right, Aaron Sloan, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we are here at your boxing gym here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, engine room boxing. And we're going to talk about boxing, but you have an interesting twist on it. But before we get to that twist, how did you get started with boxing? What's your story? Well, my, I think like a lot of uh, probably guys that got into it, their fathers or grandfathers, my grandfather was a boxer um, I, when he was young. So he always talked about boxing and we would always watch the, you know, watch the fights together, every, you know, Mike Tyson he liked. So, you know, I was maybe 11 or 12. We'd have to go to the convenience store and buy the, rent the little box you bring home and put on the TV and watch the, and watch the fight. So, you know, of course, anything that he was kind of my hero and I looked up to him. So anything that he was into, you know, that's kind of what I, what I was into. So, um, I was always interested and curious about, you know, you know, we were just kind of the background that I came from, we were just kind of mean, rough little kids anyway. And we'd get out in the yard and box with the little Sugar Ray Leonard boxing gloves and wrap my grandma's, you know, dish towels around her hand, our hands and box in, in the yard. And so that kind of got my interest up. And as, as I got older and wanted to pursue that, I started, you know, seeking out local boxing gyms and, and, and probably started when I was around, I think I started actually boxing when I was 17. Did you ever compete? Yeah, I competed for about four and a half years, only amateurs. I never did any any pro stuff. Boxed at the North Tulsa Boxing Club here in Tulsa, and, and my trainer was uh, Ed Duncan, who's a, a decently known coach, especially around here. He trained uh, uh, Quick Tillis and Dale Cook and you know some of our other bigger name guys that actually came out of Oklahoma. And so when did you transition from fighting to training? When did that happen? You know, I... I, I was boxing at a, at an early age, and uh, looking back on it now, I understand that you know we didn't travel a lot because our our coaches and our program didn't have much money to travel, so we were just I did a lot of training and didn't get a whole lot of fights. You know, we didn't travel nationally or anything like that. So, and I got a decent job in sales, and and that took a lot of time. So I just kind of phased myself out of the boxing, even though I I wanted to do it and continue to do it. It was just more of a hobby for me. I didn't have a, you know grand aspirations of going on and being a a world champion fighter or anything like that i just uh, i i just enjoyed the sport so got involved in sales and fast forward you know several you know 10 years ahead and decided to go to nursing school when the construction market slowed down i sold industrial supply sales so that slowed down and I, i ended up putting myself through nursing school and getting out of that wanting to kind of you know exercise and stuff i started thinking about boxing again and i didn't want to of course too old to compete and i was maybe 30 i think 35 i've been in it 10 years now so about 35 years old and i thought well maybe if i started you know coaching some kids or something like that it would 
you know, get me my fix for boxing and get, get that, get that part of it kind of let me play a little bit in the sport again. So I rented like a little, basically a storage building, storage unit in Owasso outside of Tulsa and opened it up, hung a few bags in it and, and put an ad in the paper. And the next thing you know, we had a, a lot of school kids coming. So, so you started training school kids, but then you started training a different type of client. And this was clients with Parkinson's disease. How did that happen? Like, what? Are, and we're going to talk about this program you developed. It's, it's a boxing program for Parkinson's patients. But how did you start training people with Parkinson's disease in boxing? You know, I, I told you we started the gym in Owasso, and it was mostly just a, you know training, like I said, c- competitive kids to box. But but you know, by the time I was there for a few years, we had people asking to maybe do some fitness training, and I had a girl that I'd I'd work with that had cerebral palsy actually, and uh, out there, and so. Having my nursing background then and then doing this boxing, it was it was kind of in the back of my head to do something a little more health related. But I just started on this nursing career and I just never entertained the idea of it. So we fast forward a few years and I've had five years of coaching experience running the gym and kind of started deciding, you know, I'd like I'd like to try to make a push at doing this full time. I'd trained a few boxers that kind of made it to a national level and I knew if I was going to coach those guys at that level, I needed to have more time to do it. You know, I couldn't be working part time any more than they could be working a lot of hours either, you know. So we moved to Tulsa and we opened this facility and I was here for about a year. And uh, one of the local doctors um, had a patient that had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And he had seen, you know, that, of course, that exercise is one of the, we can talk about later, but exercise is one of the main things that slows down the progression of Parkinson's disease. And so he recommended that he come to the boxing gym and gets, get a, and start training here. So Bobby Moore is his name. And he, he came probably, I guess, maybe three and a half years ago. And I started doing personal training with him one-on-one just for his fitness. And I think we did maybe 24 sessions and he went and visited his physical therapist and the physical therapist had noticed such uh, increase in his ability that he reached out to the Parkinson's foundation of Oklahoma and had those guys contact me about see if I wanted to start a class. So, and that's uh, what ready to fight is all about. And before we get into more about the program, what sort of, how do you, you tailor the boxing program for these guys? Let's talk about Parkinson's in general for those who aren't too familiar with it. So reminder listeners, what is Parkinson's disease? What are the symptoms? Do we know what causes it? Things like that. Yeah. I mean, Parkinson's disease is a, it's a degenerative disorder. So once you get it, it's, it, there's no cure for it. It's going to continue to get worse over time. It's a disorder that affects our central nervous system. So it primarily targets motor movement. So anything that's a motor movement is going to be affected by it. So it can affect, of course, your your balance, your speech, your handwriting. Usually most people would picture Parkinson's disease with a, a tremor course in, in one hand or sometimes both, but usually just one side. But there's more of that. They picture the shaking and the rigidity, somebody like Michael J. Fox or Freddie Roach is who they think of. But there's a lot of other things that go along with it, just a, a general slowing of movement. People lose their facial expressions. They, um, Like I said, lose their speech. There's a lot of uh, sleep insomnia disorder that goes along with it. And just, you know, dem- a lot of dementia that can come along at a certain point in time. So, And do we know, does it affect men or women more than, or is it about the same? No, it affects a lot more men than than women. I think I think it's seventy percent. I think so the number that's affected more men compared to women. I really don't know why it affects more men than women, but it it most definitely does. Genetics can play a part in in developing the disease. They know you know maybe fifteen percent, and then chemical exposure. So there's if you're exposed to a lot of pesticides or you've been like in the in the Gulf War, a lot of those guys that were get, got affected by chemical some of the chemicals and things that were used over there. Um, but the rest of the people, it's, it's kind of an unknown, unknown quantity. They really don't, they really don't know yet why it, it targets some people and not others. And yeah, I mean, and it definitely affects significantly the quality of life of an individual. I mean, absolutely right. So let's talk about what the research says. So there's no cure for it for Parkinson's, but what does the research say that what can help Parkinson's patients? Well, I mean, primarily we know that medications, the frontline approach. So Parkinson's patients suffer from either a, a lack of dopamine or the ability to use it. So levodopa or L-dopa is going to be a, almost every Parkinson's patient is going to be on, on dopamine. There's surgeries and stuff like deep brain stimulation also as well. But next to that, the next line of defense is exercise. So it's proven without a fact you know, clinically that exercise slows down the progression and, and it helps 
the neuroplasticity in our brain helps us re- regenerate neurons and new pathways. And it also helps the ability for us to uptake and regulate our dopamine better. And it needs to be a forced intensity exercise. The exercise is good, but when it's a forced intensity in it, and when I say forced intensity, I don't necessarily mean it has to be hard. It, it means that it has to be something that's not at your own pace. So I, I compare a little bit to, you know, if you went and walked outside at your own pace, it's not as beneficial as if I stick you on a treadmill and set you at a pace. Right, so right. It, it, it just, it affects the brain differently when it's forced intensity. So, so you won't find any, it, it, hardly any Parkinson's client that hasn't been recommended to exercise. And there's a lot of forms of exercise. People do dance and they do cycling and that boxing is what we're talking about here, you know, here of course today, but there's a lot of different exercise that they, they push for, for clients to do. And what do you think? So boxing is definitely, there's a forced intensity there. Because, I mean, I've, I've done the stuff like the heavy bag workouts and I just want to die yeah. after it. So there's definitely forced intensity. But do you think there's something else going on with boxing, the movements you do in boxing that sort of like it's like a secret sauce that can help Parkinson's patients? Yeah, I do, you know, and, and that's what we're, I think most people's kind of come into the consensus at that boxing is kind of the gold standard of exercise for Parkinson's disease. There's some other Parkinson's boxing programs out there, of course, as well. We think that ours is superior because of some of the changes and things that we've done with it. But I kind of tell people, you know, I, I don't know how familiar, you know, you are, our listeners are with boxing, but you said you've tried to box before. So you know that there's a, a certain movement that goes along with that. And you see a boxer and he's moving and it's real fluid. And it's, it's, it's like watching a ballet dancer and it's, it's uh, a lot of rhythm that goes along with it. And so when you're a coach and you see, I, I say this sometimes I, when I'm a coach and I see people come in, if you came through the door and you wanted me to teach you how to box, you don't move like a boxer yet. And so then I get a person with Parkinson's disease that comes in, they can't move like a boxer yet. To me, you both have movement disorders. I mean, so I need to train both of you how to move and be balanced and fight like a fighter. So I take that approach with all of them. It's not, I don't want to run a acute program that's only just a feel good program that we're all, yeah, we're training Parkinson's people to box and they just get to get by with everything. No, if you come to me to box, I'm going to train you like you're a fighter and I'm going to teach you how to box correctly. And so I think with our program, it's, it's made a big difference to approach it that with balance, reaction time, hand and eye coordination. And boxing is kind of just is built for Parkinson's disease on accident. If I put a, a client on a speed bag, if they're getting the hand and eye coordination from that, it takes a lot of hand and eye coordination to do that. And nobody can hit a speed bag when they first start. It doesn't matter if they have Parkinson's disease or not. But that bag is a, the speed bag is a forced intensity exercise because of the rhythm of it. Once you hit it, it's going to come back and you have to hit it again. And so it's telling you when you're going to hit it. You can't make up your mind when you're going to hit it. It only has one rhythm and you're going to have to adapt to that rhythm in order to be able to hit it. And all the bags in the gym are the same way. If you hit a heavy bag, it swings. And so when it swings back, you, you got to hit it or you got to move or it's going to push you off balance. And so the, the equipment in itself, if you teach them the right techniques, are going to challenge the, the, the symptoms that they have. And then in boxing, you're throwing a lot of you, – you're doing a lot of twisting motions. So Parkinson's patients suffer from a horrible rigidity. So they get where they can't twist. You'll see them turn and they turn their whole – walk their whole body around because their neck's stiff. Their waist is stiff. They don't have enough dopamine to allow those muscles to relax enough to do that. And so in boxing, there's a lot of twisting motion. There's a lot of rotation. And it puts you on the punch mitts. You're going to punch when I tell you to punch. You throw the punches that I tell you to throw. You don't get to choose which one of those punches you get to throw. So it's just that boxing is just accidentally tailor made for the symptoms of, of Parkinson's disease. So has there been any research done yet on boxing and Parkinson's? We haven't been able to find uh, really any research studies that's been targeted just for that, but we have just now got IRB approval and started research on our program here through Tulsa university. So we've been working on get, getting that approval and getting that program started for research for the last couple of years. And we just, we just now reached that point. So we're kind of, we're kind of getting the, you know, the critical mass with this program, right? Right now with our Parkinson's program after a couple of years. So we're excited. We're really excited. And all the, the neurologists and the doctors think that that's really going to bear, bear some fruit and, and kind of show what we're seeing in the gym, which is extraordinary results. And it's, Another cool thing I'll make a note on with this research study is that we're actually going to research the caregivers and the spouses. So we're going to see what difference this program makes in their lives, because if we can if we can improve the quality 
of the patient that's suffering from the disease and their life is a little easier and they're easier to get around and they're not falling at home and they're not doing those kind of things. It definitely makes it easier for their wife and uh, takes a lot of stress off of them and makes their life a lot easier. So, Well, that's really interesting you guys thought of that because some people overlook the caregiver aspect of disease. And I'm sure as a nurse, you you know, you've seen that firsthand, how it can add a lot of stress to a family. Sure. And it's, it, it spirals down and, you know, it's, it's, a uh, there is a lot of, you know, the program, the art of manliness. There is some manliness uh, traits that come along with men that hinder them for this. You know, it's primarily affecting men, but the first thing the, these men do, especially from this generation, most people that suffer from Parkinson's disease is over 60 years old. And so you get a lot of men that they get off balance and they're worried about falling and their their spouses are old. And so what they'll do is they'll shut themselves up in the house. They won't they won't go to the store because they're afraid, well, what if I fall? My wife's not going to be able to get me back up or they're not going to be able to get me to the car and she's not going to be able to help me. I don't want to put her in that situation, you know. So the men will just stay home and won't leave. And so as soon as they sit down, and they, they, I mean, they go downhill quick. I mean, you have to get started on exercise. Right, they're not moving. So, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're just moving. making it worse. And you know? so, you know, that's a big, it's a big problem. And it's, it's a, it's an ego that is driven from that generation and from that, from being a man of saying, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my spouse in that position. So once they get in here and they get this, this group of guys, it's really cool to watch. I mean, it's really neat to watch. So you started uh, your, your first Parkinson's patient was three years ago, four years ago, a little over three years, a little ago. over three years ago. How many do you have in the program now and ready to fight? I think we got right around 30 right now. Um, and then we have, well, we actually already have some affiliates as well. So I've got an affiliate in, in Edmond that has about, I think, 15 people in it. We just started one in Muskogee. And then we've got an affiliate that we're, that's up and running in, in McAllister. So. And what's the breakdown? Is it mostly men, age? Well, what does that look like? Uh, it's mostly men. I think in our program, we've, I think I've probably got maybe eight females out of the 30 participants that's in there um, and then anything under 60 years old we consider early onset and so there's probably maybe three or four of those individuals that are on early onset and just to clarify you're not you're not putting headsets on these guys gear on and like they're pounding each other it's just no. like it's a fitness box yeah it's just fitness boxing right? yeah yes and i think it's interesting because you know uh, you know boxing and parkinson's a lot you know, people think of parkinson's they think of muhammad ali sure and they attribute some people attribute his boxing career or his Parkinson's to his boxing career. Is there any connection there? Uh, yeah, of course. And, you know, I get I get that question because, you, you know, you get these questions. How do you, even with just a boxing in general, how do you as a nurse justify working these guys' corners and knowing that getting head trauma is not good, you know, and you, you're participating, you're training them to do this. And the same, the same thing comes up with the Parkinson's patients to where I've embraced a sport that, can be a, a create Parkinson's disease, and then we're using the same sport to to help it. So we, when you see like Ali and and Freddie Roach, there's no doubt that boxing brought that on. But what we look at, what we think in the in a medical world is that genetics loaded the gun and Parkinson's pu- pulled the trigger. You know, so they may have been already predisposed for it, and and uh, rough sport and head trauma brought it on. But you know, I, I I have a little chip on my shoulder about when. When I answer these kind of questions, especially if just with, with my with my athletes, because there's so many sports out here that you know that people let their kids do, and they don't want to let them box. And amateur boxing is as a is a fairly safe sport. We we really regulate it close to make sure nobody's mismatched or outclassed and things of that nature. But you know, it, to me, the sport's going to go on. It's been going on forever. It's going to happen no matter what. And I just I find it my job to make sure I'm as educated as I can about keeping my athletes safe you know i've got the background to do it i've I, i'm a good coach i want to keep my coaching standards up and so i i really these guys are going to do it anyway it's my job to make sure they do it as safely as possible whether i condone it or not and i tell my boxers all the time if you want to anytime you want to come and fill out a fafsa and go to college let's go do that instead but if you're going to do the sport we're going to do it right we're going to do it as safe as we can and we're going to be, try to make sure you have a you know a, have a long a long career with the sport that you're choosing to do yeah, I mean, when you said like genetics, you know, loaded, the, you know, cocked the gun and the the sport triggered. I mean, it reminds me of you hear about those people who keel over during a marathon, which you sure. think like, well, it's a marathon, their heart should be healthy, but you know, they had some sort of genetic malfunction, you know, something that's wrong, and it the stress just caused them to die. It was, it was going to happen anyways. The the race probably just sped it up. And yeah, it definitely can. It definitely can speed it up. And you know, people get focused on things like that because it's it's in the public eye. But I mean people will come and ask me that question and 
you know, they took a bigger chance of driving their car to come and ask me that question than what my boxers are taking in the ring. And then we don't ban cars because people die in them every day. Right. You know, it's, it's, you, you have some good and, and some bad that come along with it. And to me, the good of boxing highly, highly outweighs the negative that comes along with it. It helps so many kids in, in troubled situations. It helps people with their confidence. And I get people here, even here. I mean, I train a high, lot of executives and a lot of business owners and things like that, and they're never going to fight, but they train just as hard. And, you know, they come to me and tell me, well, this, this helped me with my confidence and my negotiating skills. This helps me with my business. This helped me just get my stress out and take my mind off the day. So it's the same thing with the Parkinson's boxers. I mean, we're going to affect some, a lot, many more people, I've had people actually tell me, I'm almost glad I got Parkinson's because I was in such bad shape before. This is the healthiest I've ever been because I actually got serious enough to start training, you know. And Bobby, the guy that came to me, he he was on a cane and he's he, he doesn't use his cane anymore. He had a trimmer in his hand. That's not noticed anymore, which that may have more to do with the medication than it does with me. But but he's lost 40 pounds since he's been here. And I mean, he's he's a machine now. I mean, he's training like three classes a day and he was, you know, having to sit down in between every round when he came. And he's like, you know, I'm, I'm healthier than I've ever been. Hey, you know, I'm going to outrun this thing. I'm going to beat this thing. And he's like, I may have died of a heart attack if I wouldn't have started boxing, you know? So the strenuous life is an online platform that we created to help you turn your intentions into actions. We've done that in a few ways. We first, we created a series of 50 different badges based around 50 different skills. There's hard skills like self-defense, wilderness survival, outdoor skills, soft skills like public speaking, social skills, personal finance, how to be a better husband, better father. We also provide accountability for you, for your physical activity every day, doing a good deed. So you're starting to think outside of yourself and thinking about something bigger. And then we also provide weekly challenges. They're going to put you outside of your comfort zone, physically, intellectually, socially. And besides, Besides the uh, weekly challenges and the, the daily check-ins and the badges, TSL Platform also provides a way for you to get together with other TSL members in your area so you can meet up in actual physical space and start doing stuff together. And the guys, the meetups are, it's a ground up thing. They're organizing it themselves. Some events are really simple just to get together for a ruck for an hour, but then other groups are planning these multi-day events where they're doing all sorts of stuff, camping outside and working on TSL stuff together. So it's a real community that's been formed here. If you'd like to get in our next enrollment, head over to strenuouslife.co. You can see everything that's involved with the Strenuous Life and then make sure you get your email on our waiting list. That'll help you be the first one to know when enrollment opens up. Strenuouslife.co, check it out and make sure to get your email on our waiting list. And I hope to see you in one of our next enrollments for the Strenuous Life. Life. Well, let's talk about some of the, the, the some of the stories of people who've come through the, this program, and it's it's helped them. As so you mentioned, Bobby came in with a cane, started doing it, and you said, you know, the medication's also involved there. But I mean, what are some of the other stories of individuals that have come in who never boxed before, never thought they'd be a boxer, but somehow their doctor said, "Hey, you should go to this place on Sixth Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and start boxing." And how did their life change after that? You know, the the first thing you see with people is everybody's a little nervous to come to a boxing gym, you know, especially they're scared to go to any gym. It's extra scary to go to a boxing gym. So I can't imagine the the amount of bravery it takes for these people to come when they have Parkinson's disease and walk into a gym like mine and say they want to box. So the moment they make that first day, it's you can see it in their facial expressions. You can see it in their confidence that, you know, they feel like they've they're already accomplished something once they're here. So that's the, that's the first thing we notice. But the biggest thing, interestingly enough, is it's the same with the exercise patients. We try to get people hooked on boxing. I try to get people to fall in love with boxing. So if I can sell you on boxing and you start learning about boxing and you fall in love with the sport and you start understanding more of the sport, the 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 getting in shape and all the other things that come along with it are just side effects of the things that you're going to do as a lifestyle. So my whole belief system is based around changing somebody's lifestyle, not about worried about your weight or worried about the things that you have. So with the Parkinson's people, I don't treat them like they're any much, you know, different than anybody else. We have exercise alter, you know, modifications we have to make, of course, that's specific for them. But, you know, I, I want them to learn how to box. And so I sell them on the boxing and, you know, they feel a part of the community and they've got a good group here. And so the biggest thing that we see right away is just the the psychosocial benefit. I mean, it's life changing and it's fast. I mean, it's fast how much difference it makes in, in people's lives. So, so are, are they, are they training with other Parkinson's patients? Other Parkinson's patients, but like down here at the gym now, when the classes are here, though, that's a mixed group. So there's other boxers in here and fighters and things like that. And 
like we discussed a little bit before the before the show, I, I had an individual gym set up for just those guys for the last three years, and we moved it because we're moving all in house. But so we'll all be in the same gym. There'll be other fighters around, other boxers around, you know, for the duration of this. And that's how most gyms will be that we set up across the country. Will be, you know, they'll be set up inside actual boxing gyms and facilities and that's what our hope is not all of them will be that way but we want them inside of an actual boxing gym and a facility so it's a little more intimidating at first but i think once they get in there it's a it's a pretty cool thing for them how's it affected your boxers without parkinson's working with these with these guys who have parkinson's it's actually pretty neat to watch because you know it's it's a requirement actually of my boxers that are on my team and the people that work for me most of the guys that work for me here and help me at the gym or my current fighters, you know, so um, when they're young guys, 20, 21 years old, a lot of them, some of them 16, 15, but, you know, I have them go down and hold mitts for, for the Parkinson's patients and help run the classes and things like that. And it's, it's a really cool dynamic because it's, I think with any young person, the same as it did with me when they come in, it gives you some true appreciation of what you're able to do and what your, what your real fight is every day, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's kind of humbling experience too, because, you know, you we take so much for granted with, with our lives and with, you know, physical fitness in general, these guys are training because they want to, you know, they, they want to be the Floyd Mayweather or the guy like that, that's famous and on TV and this world champion boxer. And they come in and see these guys that have none of that aspiration. They're 80 years old and they're training as hard as what these guys are training. Literally. I mean, they train hard and they're training as hard as you're training with no aspirations that they're training to live they're training to get better you know they're training if they're not here they're going to die it's not a it's not about glory or putting the you know the cool facebook picture up uh being a fighter this is this is life or death for them and so you know it, it changes the perspective a little bit with with these guys and at least the ones that i've had i mean maybe there's some people that wouldn't but most of those people that don't get that i probably wouldn't be working with anyway so <laughs> right uh, walk us through a, a workout for your parkinson's patients what does that look like uh it's an hour-long workout same as our other fitness classes they'll come in and we have a um, warm-up exercises that we do they're pretty standardized warm-up for their symptoms so we'll come in and uh get some you know big arm swings neck swings loosen their neck up like i said there's a lot of rigidity so we're trying to loosen them up at their hips loosen them up their legs we have exercises that are challenging their balance so we'll have different exercises we do that we rock walk rock them up on their toes tracing their hands with their eyes as they pull them above their head they, they kind of challenge their balance and things like that so we warm them up for about 10 or 15 minutes with with those kind of specific exercises for their symptoms and then the rest of the pro the program for the bulk of it's just like we're doing our boxers so they're doing the heavy bag speed bag double in bag and mitt work when we have our boxers come down and and do that with them and everybody likes the mitts the best i mean people love hitting the mitts so that's that's really what they get excited about but we do three three minute rounds on the speed bag three three minute rounds on the double in bag three three minute rounds on the heavy bag and you know hands up chin down elbows in making them you know turn their feet and hips and uh and then in between the rounds, we keep them working too. When I first started the program, we couldn't. Most of our guys weren't in that shape, but when they come now, they're they're usually in pretty good shape. So even in between the rounds, then we have a an exercise like a you know a active rest exercise that they're doing that's usually balance related. So they're doing uh, forward steps or backward steps or something with their arms above their head or in between the rounds. And then at the end, it's it's a cool down stretching. So we'll have them line up on the wall and do uh, mostly static stretches at the end before they leave. All right, so I, I, I got tired just listening to yeah, that. Yeah, it's a workout. Right. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, we were talking earlier about some of the research you're about to do on how boxing can help Parkinson's patients. One of the aspects you're looking at is how it affects the families, the caregivers of these patients. I know you haven't done any studies on this, but sort of just working with your clients you have now, what's the change you've seen there? How has it changed their family's life now that they got, now that they're boxing? One of the biggest things that, that hits them the, the earliest is they get the they, a lot of them will drive their spouses here bring their spouses and, and drop them off or they'll wait for them so you'll see you know three or four of the the spouses or five of them and they're waiting and so they get to have that discussion time it becomes like a a therapy group for them because they can you know are you having trouble with this or what's your experience with this medication or they're considering the deep brain stimulation how what's the effect that that's had for you so they're getting to share this information and getting to talk and have that outlet amongst themselves as well while they're waiting and so it really becomes a, a really good uh, group of support a support group for the uh, those people as well and a lot of it's just the activities you know at, at home and outside the house I, one of the one of the biggest changes that i've seen anybody i, I had a guy in the program named bill and 
he was on a walker and he waited, you know, super late into his disease to come in. And that's another key thing too. If when you get diagnosed, you have to get started. I mean, you've the people that's waited are the ones that I, I have the least amount of effect with. If when I've started them early, I don't hardly see any changes. Like Bobby's rolled back some changes, but I don't see any I haven't seen any degeneration in him. And the, the every group of guys that I got that started early like that over the last three years, they're like still the same. And if you can keep it still the same with Parkinson's, then you're winning the battle. But Bill had came in and he was on a walker and I had to have one of my boxers come down every day and hold him up while he hit the speed bag. If you let him go, he'd just fall forward and fall over. And I actually, I did do 12 sessions of personals with him and kind of get him caught up with the class. And then we had had that, we got him where he could stand up on his own and he wasn't falling forward anymore. And we got him going through the exercises and within a year into the program, he's he's walking in like fist bumping everybody. He doesn't have a walker. He doesn't have a cane. And so his wife was so happy about it because they had grandkids that played baseball and he couldn't go to their baseball games. Well, he's gone to their baseball games now. He's getting out of the house now. And I actually had one of the local doctors that was taking care of him call me and I didn't know who his doctor was. He was just his primary care physician. And so I got a call from him. He's like, you're taking care of Bill. That was my one of my patients. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, you know, I guess wanted to call you personally and tell you that I couldn't believe it. He walked into my office yesterday and he said, to be honest with you, I, I told them to consider a nursing home care a year ago. And he said, I couldn't believe it. So he's like, whatever you're doing, you know, made a believer out of me. So anything that we can do for you, you know, let me know. So that was really, you know, that was made me feel really good that, you know, that, that they're recognizing it like that in the medical community. And so we've had, we've got a group of doctors, five or six doctors here that all refer people over to us now. And it's, that's really, you know, helped a lot, you know, get, getting the, the physician's take that, Hey, this is really a program that's successful. And so Bill's one of the biggest life changing stories that I've, that I've seen since I've been in it. And it was one of the biggest life changing stories for his spouse because it affected their life so much as far as just getting him out of the house. I mean, he didn't want to do anything. He wouldn't do anything. He was like, he's one of those guys, like I said, that was scared. He was a big guy and he was scared if he fell down somewhere, he wasn't going to be able to get back up. And that's another thing too. We, we get them down on the ground on their, all the way on their back and we make them learn how to get up because we want to give them the confidence that there's a technique that you can use to get up off the floor. And we want everybody to be able to get up on their own. And if once you find out you can get up on your own, then you're not so scared to leave the house anymore. But if you think you're going to fall in the grocery store and you can't get up, you're not going to go, you know. So if they at least have the confidence to know that they can get up, if they do fall, they'll do a lot more in their life. Yeah, that cascading effect. Like you're not just working on the, you know, helping the patient with their life, but like you can see it cascade to other aspects of their life. It affects their wife. Then like now their grandkids has a relationship with their grandfather they probably wouldn't have had because grandpa never left the house. Yeah, it's. I mean, it doesn't just it doesn't just debilitate the patient. I mean, it wreaks havoc on the on the whole family. I mean, and it's especially some of the people that I see in the program that have that are early onset. I mean, it's it's of course it's bad at any age, but when you get it at such a young age and you know you've got to suffer through that, and your your kids are younger, and you've got these life plans of where you're you're not you haven't even retired from work yet. I mean, you know you got to lose your job, and then you get these guys that come in. It's like you know I had a, I worked in aviation all my life, and I had to give up my job. I couldn't do it anymore. So, and one of the uh, one of the the do- local doctors here that helped me kind of pioneer this program when I first got started and seeing what I was doing and is a big part of our research, Dr. Eric Sherburn, you know, that he was like, they thought he had actually had uh, Parkinson's disease. It turned out to be central tremor, but either way about it, it he, he was a neurosurgeon and had to give that career up. And so when I first got the program started, he was, he was here in house and he's, he came and said, you know, I see what you're doing with this. Just let me know if there's anything that I can do to help. And I said, well, I'd heard that you had Parkinson's disease because at that time we still didn't know. I said, but I didn't know if he was approachable with it yet. And he's like, well, you know, I, I really wasn't, but I see what's going on. So I need to, you know, get over that and get involved. And he started getting involved with our, our program. And he's, he's really the one that pushed us to get this research study going. So, so besides Parkinson's, are there any other movement disorders that you've found that boxing helps with? I've got a, one of the guys in the program doesn't actually have Parkinson's. He just has, he's been having suffering a lot of balance related issues and they couldn't figure out exactly why. So he's been coming and training with them. It's really helped him a lot. And then I've got a, a guy that I work with one-on-one that has a Wernicke syndrome, which is a, a neurological, it's more, almost resembles a stroke, but it's from a vitamin B1 deficiency. So he had had an injury when he was younger that came back and affected him later on. He ended up in the hospital and on a feeding tube and based on not getting fed enough 
food on a feeding tube, then he got that deficiency, which affected the brain. So he has a lot of balance issues, and he's really made a lot of improvements when he first came in. I don't think his improvements, if I was just guessing, I mean, I don't know. I don't think a lot of his improvements are probably neurological, but I think he's just, by training and working out, I think he's strengthened himself to the a point that he's able to compensate for a lot of the balance issues that he had. So we definitely think it's going to work. And I, we've been working on a cognitive boxing program that's based on numbers and letters and signs and stuff that I think is going to benefit some of the other diseases even more specifically. I've went over uh, once and worked with OSU with their annual stroke patient thing. So we worked with about 40 of their stroke patients. And I really think it's going to have some benefits in, in that areas as well. And we have plans to to roll the ready to fight name out in different programs. We just started a youth boxing program that we're piloting with Tulsa Public Schools under the ready to fight logo. And then we're going to do uh, the next one probably that's going to be a uh, post cardiac rehab. I'm a cardiac nurse by trade and Don that I hired after he retired from the hospital, he actually oriented me, oriented me in as a nurse and then he retired and I hired him to come and work for me at the Parkinson's gym. His background's in cardiac. So we think we could really use this boxing to, you know, keep people interested. It's it's using boxing as an interesting modality to exercise. I mean, that's all it is. And we think we can use that for almost any kind of disease process as well as we can get people in the gym and keep them interested. Right. It's better than just walking on a treadmill. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's just so hard to motivate yourself to go do that. But if you find something that's fun and that you like you're going to go do it. So the uh, most of the people we have here are looking forward to coming to the gym. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to build a business or a gym off of, you know, having a bunch of members that I bill every month and they don't ever come to the gym. You know, if, if I want my clients in the gym, you know, I want them here working out and, and we're not a, you know, we're just not into, and we're, like I said, we're into lifestyle building. We're not into just trying to get as many gym dudes as we can. Right. Know? So uh, you mentioned, so you're talking about the future of this program. So you're going to start helping uh, cardiac patients. How do you see this expanding with the Parkinson's patients? Are you expanding it across the state? Are you hoping to take this national? What are the goals there? We want to take it national. There's other uh, another national program out there that's a really good program at its core. But the way it's been distributed out and the way it's been done hasn't been followed that close from from my regard as a nurse to do research and stuff off of. So my concern was is that Hey, I think boxing's the superior program over all exercise for Parkinson's. But if we keep having people out there that are not teaching it to the core of boxing strictly enough, then I think they're going to lose that. And it'll probably still be beneficial because they're exercising. But I think if somebody were to do research on that, they're going to determine that it's just equal to cycling. And I right, just, so you're, and you're, I just, you're worried that the other, like some boxing programs that come out that treat Parkinson's, they're watering down boxing, which will help, which will be a, to a detriment to the patient. I think so. Okay. I, you know, these people only have so much time that they can do. They have all these other doctor's appointments, they have handwriting classes, speech therapy classes. And so I want to make sure that my patients are spending, if they're spending an hour a day exercising, I want them to make sure that they're doing the best exercise available. And if it came out to be something else, then so be it. But right now, I believe it's boxing. And I think most people in the healthcare f- f- field that I'm working with believe that it's boxing. And so, you know, I want to create a program that's for sure going to make sure that we can do research, not just in my gym, but across the country and on a large spectrum and prove that boxing really is the best way you can spend your hour of time exercising. And so that, that, that was really my goal is want to roll it out nationally. Now I'm behind the ball, you know, so there's already a national program out there. So we come up with ours and you get blended into, well, what's the difference? Boxing's boxing and Parkinson's disease is Parkinson's disease. And, you know, that's as far as they look. So uh, actually, we j- just this week finally, and I had our contract signed with USA Boxing, who we're an affiliate gym of. We all of our amateur boxing program runs there in the USA Boxing. It's governed by the USOC, the United States Olympic Committee. So it's already a national program, of course, one of the largest boxing. It is the largest boxing program in the country, and so we just partnered with those guys to be their official boxing program for USA Boxing. I go to Columbus, Ohio this week to to talk to the coaches there. And then hopefully in December, we're going to start training coaches. So with teaming up with those is going to instantly take us to be a national program. And I'm looking to 
hopefully roll out two to 300 affiliates over the next three years. That's awesome. So what, what can people do who are listening now? I'm sure there's someone listening. There's got to be. We've got a lot of listeners who they might have Parkinson's or they have someone who has Parkinson's, um, but they're not in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Sure. They're not in Edmond, Oklahoma. What's their best bet? I mean, could they just go walk into a gym and say, hey, I got Parkinson's and I just want a regular workout? I mean, what did, what, yeah, how- I would still go. I mean, if I was those guys, I would definitely, I would I would still go get in the boxing program that's close to them. I wouldn't matter. I mean, I'm going to see, I would send you to the competitor. I mean, go right. to the boxing gym and get and get working um and they could look up you know just they can probably get with their local parkinson's foundation every state's going to have some a parkinson's group and so i would reach out to those guys and find out um you know where those programs are and where they could get started because they don't need to wait i mean they need to get started right don't be waiting on me they need to get started right away and then as this program grows then those those foundations will be reaching out to and letting them know that we have this specific program in their area now so the, that education will be coming as we expand but you know that's going to be slow over the next couple of years and if i mean to me if you find out you have parkinson's disease I would, I would, I would get in a boxing program as as soon as possible. So, and let's say people who are listening to this, maybe they're boxers and they're like, they want to help with this. Anything they can do? Sure. Yeah. They could, I mean, they could reach out to me and contact us, of course, uh, or contact USA Boxing and that's going to get them to the same, same result now. So, and they want to become an affiliate of our program or teach our program, then, you know, we would love to look at them and have them. Now I can say we're not, we're, we're probably going to be a little more selective than some of the other certifications out there. Our program is going to be hard. It's going to have a continuing education component of it that nobody else has. And so it's, we're, you know, we're going to be picky about who we let run these programs because we want them held to a high standard that's based off of the research that we're doing with our local program here. So, you know, we've turned in a specific set of exercises with specific movements that need to be done for specific times, and that's what we're researching, and that's the model that I want to push forward with all of these all of these affiliates. But anybody that knows, even if you don't know anything about boxing, that doesn't mean that we can't coach you and train you and teach you to run our program to a high enough standard for our Parkinson's disease. They're not training people for competition boxing. We need people that's going to, that are, you know, if you're, if you're a fitness trainer or a personal trainer or somebody has exercise background that has some other knowledge, we can definitely make that work for sure. So where can people go to learn more about ready to fight? Uh, You could go to uh, ready to fight boxing.com and look at our website and find out more about it. You can look on the engine room boxing.com as well and, and, and find other information on there. Awesome. Well, Aaron Sloan, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. My guest today is Aaron Sloan. He's the founder of Ready to Fight Boxing. It's a fitness program designed specifically for Parkinson's patients. You can find more information about it at readytofightboxing.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash ready to fight, where you can find links to resources, where you can delve deeper into this topic. Well, that wraps up another edition of the AOM Podcast. Check out our website at artofmanliness.com where you can find our podcast archives as well as thousands of articles we've written over the years. we got a whole series on boxing. So if that interests you, go check that out as well. And if you'd like to enjoy ad-free episodes of the AOM Podcast, you can do so on Stitcher Premium. Head over to Stitcher Premium, sign up, use code MANLINESS for a free month trial. Once you're signed up, download the Stitcher app on Android or iOS and you can start enjoying ad-free episodes of the AOM Podcast. And if you haven't done so already, I'd appreciate it if you take one minute to give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. It helps out a lot. And if you've done that already, thank you. Please consider sharing the show with a friend or family member who you think would get something out of it. As always, thank you for the continued support. Until next time, this is Brett McKay reminding you not only to listen to the AON podcast, but put what you've heard into action. <laughs>